Well, hey, good morning, friends. Welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. I'm Pastor Paul Bartholomew, and it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're in the third Sunday of Advent already, which is a little crazy to me. Um, how in the world we got to this place this soon, I do not know. But, uh, but here we are, and so what a beautiful time. What a beautiful time. I do pray that in the midst of the, the madness, if you will, of the Christmas season, I do pray that it truly has been for you a time to celebrate Advent, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, first as a babe in Bethlehem, and, but then looking forward to his soon return. So what a day that's going to be. But in the meantime, it's just good to be able to gather with you here around the Word again today. And so uh, let's start with the word prayer, and then we're going to get into a message that is simply, Jesus is sight for the blind. All right, let's pray. God, as we gather this morning, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to call upon your name, to know that you are near. God, we thank you that, that in the midst of the hustle and bustle, in the midst of the decorating, the, the cookie baking, the shopping, uh, uh, well, and Lord, truth be told, you know I'm making all this stuff up because I'm not in any of that stuff that's being taken care of by a lot of others in my family. But in the midst of it all, uh, the scheduling, the all of that, Father, I pray that our hearts might rest in you. Lord, that we might truly just, uh, just rest in your presence, uh, knowing that... Uh, Lord, that, that indeed you are with us. What a beautiful time of year to be reminded of the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, Lord, to, to see this incredible gift of a Savior uh, who had come. Uh, Lord, we are, we are grateful people. And if we're not grateful, then I pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, to, to understand why we should be all because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So as you, uh, as you turn with me to the Word again this morning, then the text that we're looking at once again is, is actually out of Luke chapter 4, which you may be thinking, wait, I thought the birth narrative in Luke's gospel was chapter 2, and you would be correct. But we're in chapter 4, uh, so the, his ministry has begun and he is, uh, we see him being rejected at Nazareth, uh, down about verse 14 of Luke chapter 4. He returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The news about him spread through the whole countryside, and he taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. But then he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so we've been working our way through this in this Advent season. He has anointed me, Jesus said, to preach good news to the poor. Pastor Chad uh, did a terrific message on that, uh, helping us understand that, that indeed this good news is to those who understand their spiritual poverty and look to the hand of the Father for salvation in Jesus Christ. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, freedom for the captives, and, and ultimately, well, the... The people of Israel were, were held captive at the time of this. Um, as a result of the dispersion, not everybody returned to the homeland, and so, so they knew about captivity. But, but we also understand that all of us, prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ, all of us were, were captives of sin. We were, we were slaves to sin, slaves to unrighteousness. And then, um, as a result of the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Uh, many of us have heard, heard his voice calling us and we came uh, to, to be released from our captivity to sin, uh, our slavery to sin and unrighteousness, and we have become slaves to righteousness through Jesus Christ. And so, indeed, uh, he has said uh, Christ had come to bring good news to the poor, uh, to be good news to the poor. He came to be freedom for those who are in captivity in, in, uh, to sin, and he came to be the recovery of sight for the blind. And so uh, we're, that's where we're going to take a look this morning, the recovery of sight for the blind. As we think about the narrative, the birth narrative of our Lord Jesus, and we're going to be taking a look more closely at that on Christmas Eve, the night of Christmas Eve, uh, because next Sunday is Christmas Eve, but in the morning. So we, when we gather and worship, we're going to stay in this, uh, in this particular series that we're in. And so we're going to take a look next week at, at him being released for the oppressed. Well, but, but today... We want to take a look, remembering that it is, in fact, while we're not looking at a birth narrative in Luke's gospel right now, we recall the birth narrative in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, when the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And he went on to tell them of a Savior who was born. Um, well, that Savior... That Savior is the one who stood up in the synagogue and read this passage of Isaiah and said, No, listen, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind and release for the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, then after Jesus said that, before he sat down, tells us in verse 21, and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, so I just noticed my text, by the way, in case you're reading it and caught me on this. He actually sat down before he said that. He didn't say that before he sat down, but nevertheless, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus was letting them know that the good news that had been proclaimed by the angel, uh, good news to all people, well, in fact, this Messiah, this is Jesus the Christ. He is the one who is good news to the poor, release for the prisoners, for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and... Uh, than the release for the oppressed. But as we take a look at recovery of sight for the blind today, I mean, we do know, don't we, that, that, uh, that there is a physical blindness and we also understand that there is spiritual blindness. Now, you may be wondering, if you look at this text and say, well, his recovery of sight for the blind, then, well, that's really cool. That is, that is so cool because... Well, I've got relatives that are blind, or I have, you know, maybe it's my dad, maybe it's my daughter, it's, maybe it's perhaps it's my son. You know, they've been suffering with blindness, and, uh, and this would be great news. He is recovery of sight for the blind. Well, he is. Is he able uh, to, to say the word and a blind eye be made to see? He absolutely is. He is creator God, according to the scriptures, nothing was made except that he made it. And he certainly, this Jesus certainly has the power to heal physically the blind eyes and to open them. But is that really what Jesus would have been speaking about when he talks about the, the Messiah, the one, the promised one to come? Is it, was it really a matter of Hey, listen, uh, and so we're going to empty the prisons, those millions of people that we talked about last week. Uh, we're going to empty those prisons, and uh, we're going to set them free, and wherever there are blind people, we're going to heal them. Uh, well, no, you know what, that's not actually what that's about. I want to encourage you to now turn over into John chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn over to John chapter 9. We're going to be taking a look today at a passage that uh, 
where we actually get to see spiritual blindness and physical blindness all in one passage. And, uh, and I think you're going to be able to recognize which one takes priority to Jesus the Christ. And so, so John chapter 9. We'll begin with verses 1 through 12, which simply says this, As Jesus went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it him or his parents that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, this word means sent. And so the man went and he washed and he came home seeing. And his neighbors uh, and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. But others said, No, nah, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, No, I'm the man. Well, then how then were your, ear, were your eyes, excuse me, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. And he replied, Well, this man that they called Jesus, he made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and I washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked him. I, I don't know. He said, I don't know. And so we're going to pause there and just chat a little bit about what we're seeing in this first few verses. One of the things that, that you'll notice is the question of sin and suffering. Um, it was pretty common Jewish thought to believe that if there was suffering in life, then there must have been sin. So anyone who had uh, great difficulty in their life, really, it, you, you were just assumed guilty by the religious folk because it's like, oh, God's punishing him. Uh, he must have done something really, really bad. I actually saw that carried over into the church in which I grew up. Um, when uh, one of the individuals uh, had, a, had a child who was seriously ill, and their own friends turned on them at that point and said, listen, so what have you done? Oh, we, we don't know that we've done anything. Oh, no, you must have done something for your child to be this sick. No, really, we don't know anything. And like, how long are you going to be so stubborn? You need to just confess this and get over this so that God can release your child from this illness. So it wasn't just back in that day, it's, it's carried over into a culture today that, you know, interestingly enough, if everything is going right in our lives, it's like, well, God is happy with me. And if, every, you know, if things are hard, uh, then, it's, uh, then it's real quick for other people to believe, oh, God must be punishing you. What'd you do? Why are you having such hardship? Anyway, but that was something that the, in, in Jesus' day, that was something that they dealt with. And so even his disciples said, so Rabbi, who was it that sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, what a ridiculous question. He was born blind. How could it possibly have been the man himself? Nevertheless, people always want to find an answer for suffering, right? Always want to find there's got to be a reason here. And so anyway, uh, but to this question of sin and suffering, the connection between the two. Uh, now, we do realize that brokenness is all a result of the fact that we're in a sin-filled world world. Sin has left its stain, and so there is suffering, and we get that. But, but as, it, as it relates to, you know, punishment coming directly, directly for sin in this way, Jesus himself refuted it when he said, well, it was neither this man nor his parents. This was allowed, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. 
This happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And so, all sorts of things here uh, that, that we could take a look at. One of those is the principle that, hey, listen, friends, your life, my life, they belong to God. If he wants to give us great joy all the days of our lives, he can. Uh, if he wants to allow suffering into our lives, that is certainly his prerogative. He is God and we are not. So, uh, so, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It, it was, this was, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So we see that. We get down around verse 6, and, and though, but we do see this compassion of our Savior, and great compassion of our Savior in the face of human suffering. Okay? And I, and I love that because, you know, when we're talking about, you know, which of these has priority to Christ, the physical suffering or the spiritual suffering or the, spiritual, the physical blindness or the spiritual blindness, well, then clearly the spiritual blindness is going to be the one which takes priority. Um, you, you might even think about it this way. Do you remember when, when Jesus said, hey, listen, uh, if, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Why? Well, it is better for you to, uh, well, let me find that. I'm going to mess it up. So let me, let me see. Did you ever do that? I, I do that. Um, and and so, so anyway, he says, listen, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, listen, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. And so, uh, so we see again, does, is, is the spiritual health, is that always the priority of God? I believe that it is. Always the priority of the Christ is, uh, is our spiritual well-being. Now, having said that, does that mean that Jesus has no compassion in regards to physical uh, decline, is it in regards to physical decay uh, and disease? No, it doesn't mean that at all. We know that he is compassionate. In this particular case, he saw this man who had been born blind, and, and then in verse 6, so after he had reminded them, he's like, no, I'm the light of the world. Uh, I'm the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the, on the man's eyes. You may, by the way, uh, be wondering, so what's the significance there? And, and I would just say this to you. If you figure that out, then you please let me know. Um, Except it shows, I think it shows the creative genius of our Savior. Uh, it shows his power. He's not locked into, you know, any kind of uh, mumbo jumbo. There's no magic words. There's nothing like that. He is Lord. The power resides in him. Quite honestly, he could have done uh, quite a few different things and, uh, and, and sent the man to be healed, and the man would have been healed. So, um, but we see the Lord's compassion in the face of human suffering, and we see his power to heal. The man went home seeing. And so when they asked him, his neighbors had said, wait, how is it that your eyes are open? Well, uh, this man that they called Jesus put mud on my, uh, made some mud, put it on my eyes, told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so then I went and washed and I could see. What happened in verse 13, um, the, the Pharisees, then this is a Sabbath, this healing is on the Sabbath. And so that gets the attention of the Pharisees. They want to make sure that everybody's doing everything just right, according to the law. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes. The man replied, and I washed, now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, well, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And so they were divided. And finally they turned again to the blind man and said, 
What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. And the man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still didn't believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for his parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? Well, we, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind, but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. And so his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Well, a second man, or a second time, they summoned the man who had been born blind. So give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, the man says, well, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But I do know one thing. I was blind, now I see. And then they asked him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open it, your eyes? He said, I, I've told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And then they hurled insults at him and they said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, Now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, so, as we walk back through this portion of it, so again, you know, it would, uh, that, that Jesus on several occasions actually got in trouble uh, with the Pharisees for healing on the Sabbath. Uh, that was equated to work. And uh, so in the minds of a good Pharisee, it's like, no, absolutely, you cannot do that. No healings are to take place on the Sabbath. And, and of course, Jesus, as we know, is Lord of the Sabbath. And so... Uh, so yeah, is, is the Sabbath Lord over the Lord of the Sabbath? I don't think so. Jesus knew that it wasn't, and so Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. Uh, he used reasoning at other times, like, hold on, if your ox, if your neighbor's ox was in a ditch, wouldn't you help him on the Sabbath? So, anyway. So, verses 13 through 15, we, we see here how they begin this investigation, and they want to know they had been brought, they brought the man in before the Pharisees. And, uh, and he kept with the same story. He kept with the same story. I do love it that he didn't try to embellish. He simply told the story of Jesus, which, by the way, is great uh, counsel for us. Just tell the story of Jesus. What was the condition you were in when he found you? What did he do? And what's different in your life since then, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. So what happened? How did he do this? Who is this man? And he put mud in my eyes, and I went and washed, and now I see. I mean, the Pharisees, they're going to dig into this. And, and so you notice that there are division in the ranks then because some said he is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were like, yeah, but can a sinner do that? And, and so there's division. It seems, by the way, almost, that, that this man who was born blind recognizes the, the division and he just wants to poke the bear a little bit with some of his sarcastic responses. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, they were getting nowhere with the boy. Verse 17, they turned to him again and said, well, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. He said, I, I, he's a prophet. Well, so they said for mom and dad. And, and it was, wasn't very long before they weren't getting anywhere with mom and dad either. Well, how is it now that he can see? Parents afraid. The parents were afraid because they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue for 
suggesting that this man was the Christ, this one who had, who had healed him. They're like, uh, listen, you know what? How he got healed, how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we, we, we don't know. He's of age, ask him. And so they were getting nowhere with the boy, they were getting nowhere with the parents. Uh, and then you notice the slander of the Pharisees, uh, the slander of Christ, excuse me, by the Pharisees. They summoned the man who had been born blind, give glory to God. In other words, you tell the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. Uh, declaring Jesus the Christ a sinner. That's a pretty crazy spot to be, which really just helps us understand their spiritual blindness. Well, we begin to see evidence of a new disciple in the young man because of this man, he's like, well, hey, listen, I'm in there again. It's in that sarcasm in verses 25 to 27, where he's like, wait, do you want to become a disciple too? Well, what's implied in that? He had become a disciple. He had become a disciple. Having his eyes opened, he had become a disciple. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. As a result of having his physical eyes opened, he began to follow Jesus. He began to be a student of him, right? Evidence of a new disciple. Well, listen, here's the thing. I don't know, but here's what I'm sure of. I was blind and now I see. Very simple, very simple explanation, very simple definition. And, and again, which is why I would encourage you to, to write out your testimony, uh, to, to, to spend a little time articulating where you were when Christ found you, how you came to saving faith, and how life has been different since then. That's what this man is telling. It's really a pretty simple technique. But he gave evidence to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Then it goes on and we see further evidence of the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. We already see it. When they, we, we recognize it in verses um, when they said earlier, hey, we know this man is a sinner, verse 24. But down in verse 28 and 29, they hurled insults at the man after he had said, oh, do you want to become his disciple too? They hurled insults at him, and they said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And what are they doing? Absolutely declaring their loyalty to Moses. Absolutely blind to the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of the work that had been done in and through Moses, right? That Jesus is the one uh, to whom those men of old were pointing, the one to whom they were looking for. Uh, you know, this, that there was this covenant that God established uh, with Moses uh, between God and man with, uh, in the, during the time of Moses. But then Jesus said, oh, no, listen, uh, this blood is the new covenant in my blood. And so there is, this, there is this new covenant in the blood, of, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, but we see the spiritual blindness of these guys who are like, you are this fellow's disciple. We, we are disciples of Moses. And they took their spiritual high ground, distinguishing them from the Christ. Uh, the one of whom Scripture tells us, as we know now, that God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. Uh, that Jesus, the one of whom Scripture says that, you know, there is, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The same Jesus who said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That Jesus. That Jesus. It's the one that the Pharisees pushed aside and said, no, 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 we are disciples of Moses. And we see their spiritual blindness. In verses 30 through 33, we see the newly sighted man's faith. I mean, look at him, look at him. So young in his faith journey and yet, willing to speak up against the Pharisees in this way, he says, you know, that's remarkable. 
You don't even know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. No one has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And I just love that faith of this man who was born blind, this brand new disciple of Jesus the Christ. Uh, he just declares it so plainly. And then, and then they make in verse 34, and I realize I just left this off my slide, unfortunately. But, but in verse 34, to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. I, did they, were they unaware? I, no, this is an evidence of their spiritual blindness as well. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? Friends, what else? What do we know? Uh, who else was steeped in sin at birth? <coughs> who else was steeped in sin at birth? Well, I submit to you that those Pharisees were. But not simply those Pharisees. I was steeped in sin at birth. You were steeped in sin at birth. It's really kind of interesting that they looked to this man and said, you were steeped in sin at birth. You can almost hear them sneering, the sneer. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, which I love that, by the way, he found him, which means he was looking for him. He was searching him out, seeking him out. When he found him, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, who is he, sir? <clears throat> Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. This, the, the, <coughs> excuse me. Um, this, this spiritually blind man, who now is aware of his spiritual darkness, looked to the light and received his spiritual sight, right? But he wasn't the only spiritual one. So, so in the earlier sections, uh, the whole rest of this chapter is all about this man who is physically blind receiving his physical sight. But here it is in verses 30 through or 35 through 38. We see that this spiritually blind man who is now aware of his spiritual blindness, he looks to the light. So, <clears throat> who is this son of man? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Well, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one who is speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped. It had to have been a genuine confession of faith and the fact that Jesus the Christ indeed um, accepted the worship that this man brought. So the spiritually blind man, now aware of his spiritual darkness, looked to the light and he received his spiritual sight. But there was another group. Jesus says in verse 39, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and that those who see will become blind. Who were those who could see but who had become blind? Well, in this case, it's the Pharisees. Uh, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and they said, What, are we blind too? And Jesus said, oh, You know, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Well, what's going on? They had insisted on calling their darkness light. They, they were spiritually blind, and, and yet they stood on that as light. That was, they called darkness light. They called evil good and good evil. They looked at the Christ and cast him out so that they could stay in the law of Moses, if you will. 
betting that their goodness was going to be sufficient. The spiritually blind may now aware of a spiritual darkness, looks to the light, receives sight. The, those who insisted on calling their darkness light, well then they remain blind. Jesus the Christ, he had come to, to preach good news to the poor. And the release for the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. Friends, it wasn't simply uh, the, the blind uh, physical eyes that he came to bring light to. But to, to restore sight to those who would reject their blindness and turn to the one who said, as we read in the early part of this, I am the light of the world. Under those who would understand their spiritual darkness and turn to the light, they'll receive their sight. We used to sing an old hymn, and with this I close, but we used to sing an old hymn that says, Come to the light. And so you can hear this appeal. You can hear this appeal. Come to the light. Tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. And friends, that declaration is the declaration of everyone who has come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Friends, the Savior will not force his light on you, upon you, but you are welcome to it. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Let's pray. Father God, we so thank you that we have the opportunity to call upon your name uh, once again. Uh, Lord, in, in large group or in small groups or individually, we thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and know that you hear us. God, as we come today, I do pray, Lord, that, that indeed... Um, I, I just have this feeling, Father, that many to whom I am speaking right now already know of the light of Jesus Christ and have already come to saving faith in Him. But Father, God, I know that there are those. I, I, I don't have to spend much time on social media to realize that there are a great number of people who are lost in spiritual darkness, who have eyes that are blinded that only can be opened when they turn to the Christ. Many who try to make sense of the scriptures, which can only make sense to us when, when the veil is removed. And, and so, Father, we thank you for sending your Son uh, to, to buy our pardon on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for his ministry of good news to the poor and release for those who are in spiritual captivity, slaves to sin. We thank you, Father, that he is indeed the recovery of sight to the blind. And we look forward, Lord, to, we look forward to that, um, Lord, for all those who are walking in darkness. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes. We would see Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, listen, appreciate you tuning in once again today. I love you like crazy. And I do pray that you're enjoying the joy of the Advent season. Amen. Oh,